How does one become a chairman? Do you want to be a chairman? No, I just want to know how one becomes a chairman because Andrew here is very interested in pursuing a career in the conservative arts. Oh, really? Do you guys think I'm just telling the country because Sir, you know what I'm Maybe so. Falling a broom around that for shitheads like you for the last eight years, I've learned a couple of things. I look through your letters, look through your lockers. I listen to your conversation. You don't know that, but I do. I am the eyes and ears of this institution, my friends. By the way, that clock's 20 minutes fast. And of course, folks, that was the lovable custodian, Carl Reed, in The Breakfast Club. And today's guest played him to perfection. He has done it all in Hollywood, theater, you name it. This gentleman has seen it and been a part of it. It is my pleasure to welcome to In the Spotlight, the one and only John Kapalos. And John, I want to thank you for coming on today. It's a real honor. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So, John, let me ask you, um, How did the love, where did you first decide that you wanted to get into acting? Basically, it's it's kind of a cliche, but I did a play in high school. I'd done one in public school, you know, between uh, being grade three or third grade or fifth grade or something. But in high school, I did a high school play, Guys and Dolls, and um, got out of class, uh, got to uh, perform with a variety of people, got to meet girls, <laughs> and also uh, got a lot of adulation and attention, did well, got to sing, and got to perform, and yeah. um, got to meet a bunch of people that sort of in the theater department that I thought were more interesting than the jocks I was hanging out to up until that <laughs> And, um, you know, I, I continued, I, I finished high school and went into university, and and sort of kept up the uh, idea of doing something else. But around, and I did a, some plays in university and became part of the, the uh, drama society there. And then after a couple of years of doing that, I changed my major uh, from journalism to film. And then uh, theater was sort of beckoning. Anyway, um, Long story short is I, I sort of truncated my university experience, took a year off, did a bunch of strange stuff, you know, worked on an oil rig, and and then, then I came back and got involved with Second City. And that was like when I was around 21, 22. Right. And in Second City in Toronto, and then uh, through a series of uh, unforeseen incidents, I became part of Second City in Chicago. Right. And John, I, I ask a lot of people this because uh, it differs from time to time. But what did you enjoy doing more, um, theater or did you enjoy uh, act, uh, like films? What was your favorite thing to do? Well, I always wanted to do. Um, hold on one second. I always wanted to do movies. Yeah. Um, but I didn't feel like. um the first time I did a movie, I was so ill prepared to really feel relaxed and, um, you know, on, in front of the camera. There, there's something about the theater that allows you to um, throw it away. And so I think, for me at least, and I think one of the the better part is the parts of the process. I mean, every every person is different, every actor is different, but to work in the theater is like learning how to walk and then being able to get in the movies and do other stuff, even more progressive theater or bigger types of theater that's learning how to run and fly. So right. if there's a progression to it that way. Um, you know, there are some actors that only do theater. There are a lot of film actors that I know that have never done theater. Um, I always wanted to do movies, always wanted to do movies, but there are different ways of doing movies and acting in front of the film in front of camera too. So, yeah. Um, 
But, you know, for me to, to say, it's kind of like, do I like my left side or my right side? I kind of favor my right side because I'm right-handed. So I kind of favor the film side. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I like the plastic. I like the, you know, the things that people sometimes complain about the movie business, like, you know, the stop and start of it and uh, being disjointed and, you know, doing it in out of sequence is the stuff that I kind of find interesting about it. Um, I used to watch movies with my mom a lot when I was a kid. Yeah. The afternoon movie. And, um, you know, I'd go off to school and f I'd watch the beginning of it and think about how it came out. And I'd come back home after school and we'd talk about it and she'd tell me how it came out. Somehow it came out, sometimes it came out differently than it was in my mind. But I remember coming to the realization in about eighth grade or something. That, oh, Yeah. These are actors doing this in front of a camera. It, you know, this isn't really a war movie. They're not really in a plane over, you know, Germany dropping bombs. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, I was disillusioned for about a month or two, going, "Oh, that's some movies are fake." And then I said, "Well, wait a minute. That's kind of cool. How did they do that?" You yeah. know. And then, um, but you know, um, I, I think, I think. Maybe thanks to me and, and and a sort of a whole generation of baby boomers, we made it look easy that people are going into the arts a lot more these days. But especially friends and people I know, and you know, oh, this so and so's friend is in that kid's kid is an actor, and so on. You know, but in my world, when I was a kid, I didn't know anybody who was going to be an actor. Yeah. So when I told my dad, to circle around back to when you asked me, you know, when I be. You know, when I said, said when I was around 21, I think I want to do this professionally. My father sort of widened his eyes and was like stunned for a bit. And the thing is, uh, John, I think you were about 28 when the Breakfast Club first was made or whatever. So you kind of 27, maybe a bit younger, but I think when it came out, I was about 28. But when we shot it, I was probably 26 or seven, but that's immaterial right but i mean usually you have to uh go through some ups and downs you got to get your feet wet and stuff i know um i just had uh john john fiore on today who did a lot of small roles to get the bigger roles he would get i mean did you have to do like commercials or small bits in order to get your foot in the door well i still have to do small bits i mean the fact of the matter is is that acting is you know, sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small. Um, and it, so I'm, I, it, it, the size of the part is sometimes immaterial. Um, initially, yeah, I mean, I did a lot of stuff that was like, I mean, I did extra work once on a movie. And that was way before I got into Second City. And I did it in Toronto one day on a movie. And that was pure drudgery. And... Um, I, you know, I did, when I was in Chicago, I did a lot of uh, regional commercials, you know, for a lot of different products. Yeah. Banks and stuff, you know, whatever the job was. Chicago in those days was really um, a lot of uh, a lot of regional advertising. And so you could make a lot of, you know, really, really crummy ads. I did like one for a waterbed company which will never be seen. I've got it on videotape. I mean, if that gets onto YouTube, I'm lost. And then, um, you know, banks and uh, uh, oil companies. I remember played mechanics. There was a director named Settlemeyer in, in Chicago in the 80s uh, who did Where's the Beef? Yeah. That commercial. He did a lot of commercials, AT&T. He had a lot of stuff. I did stuff for at and And then I also wrote commercials for um, Amico Premium Lead Free. I produced like 450 commercials. Wow. Radio, and uh, wrote them and then also won what they call Clio Awards in the uh, advertising business. Yeah. Uh, do you hear that in the background? Yeah. Yeah. That's a lovely Los Angeles helicopter, police helicopter. <laughs> doing a five o'clock crawl over the city. Nice. <laughs> kind of Blade Runner style. 
<laughs> but um, you know, um, it's it's. I've said this often, but I think it's it's true. I mean, the thing about working at Second City, which I just love to do, and I spent my twenties doing that from twenty two to until thirty. I held on to that job tenaciously, and uh, was that being on stage or being in front of a camera is really like <clears throat> real flight time. You're really up in the air to continue the analogy of the helicopter that's flying overhead. Now you can leave that open. It's fine. Right. He's got a sliding door here that <laughs> can kind of shut out reality. But um, the notion is that you know, was, things are invariably going to go wrong in front of the camera or in front of um, the audience, primarily in front of the audience. And that's when you really can separate the uh, the wheat from the chaff, you know, the pros from the non-pros. And, 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 and that, that bodes well for you when you're in professional situations outside of that, when you're in the movies and stuff. And um, I learned very early on uh, when I started in Chicago at Second City that... Um, that uh, the Midwest, Toronto, um, you know, the places I toured when I was in the touring company with Second City, which you know followed, and, and then I was in the main company. The Midwest were play, and, and all those places were places where you can learn commercials otherwise and, and make mistakes. But the second you go to New York or Los Angeles, you got to be prepared. Yeah, and. The, uh, a lot of people come to New York and L.A. wanting to learn, taking workshops and this and that. And in my opinion, that's kind of a big mistake. Because when you go to L.A. and New York, people take a look at you once and then they make a decision on you. And like you can hang out there for another 10, 12 years. But if you've been seen by people for a nanosecond way back when, they're not going to see you again. Right. I mean, that's the cold hard truth about show business is people pass on you in a nanosecond yeah and um, and that's it decisions are made you know right so let me ask you john um you've done you did quite a few john hughes films but obviously people know you very well for the breakfast club tell me how that audition came about and what was interesting about that john is when you think about it if you take the parents right out of the you know, first couple scenes, basically it's seven cast members and you're one of those seven cast members. So just tell me how that audition came about for you. Well, um, I can quite simply say there was no audition for it. I mean, my audition for Breakfast Club was 16 Candles, was auditioning for 16 Candles and then doing that movie. Yeah. Because I did the film and um, 16 Candles. And I remember John saying, oh, I got this other script. Uh, it's fabulous. You're going to, you know. I remember him saying to me, you're going to be the next Bill Murray. It's like, oh, God forbid. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's the, the, there was just like many, many things that people say to you at the time. I remember somebody said to me, oh, yeah, another director said to me, I'm going to be the next Bob Hoskins. Well, Bob Hoskins is now dead, so I'm glad I'm not him. Right. Um, but a wonderful actor. But, you know, when somebody says you're going to be the next somebody, you know, you know, you're going to be the next Elon Musk. It's like, oh, no. So it's just, <laughs> um, but uh, then then uh, he said, I got a great script that I'm working on. And he told me the name, The Breakfast Club. And uh, he told me a little bit about it. And we were shooting, I remember, um, stuff outside the church, 16 Candles, where I come out of the church with a cigarette. And, and my uh, bride is whacked out. And I grab her and we go into the limo and we that whole sequence and i remember that day he spent a fair bit of time telling me about um the breakfast club which was you know exciting and you know you're working on a movie and some the director who's surrounded by all the hottest people in hollywood is saying that he's gonna make this movie so flash ahead um <laughs> several several years about a year and a half the breakfast club i mean uh, 16 candles has come out and I'm, I was with the Second City Resident Company, and we uh, had the good fortune of working, opening a sh show at the Village Gate. And that's really kind of a nice coincidence that I had this on the Village Gate in New York. 
and um, there in, in those days they had trade papers, the Variety and the East Coast, Variety and the West Coast, and uh, the Variety in the East Coast was a much thicker, sort of a, more of a weekly uh, variety, and um, I had the tendency of reading the trade papers, although I sort of weaned myself off of them out over time. <laughs> and I picked it up, and, I'm, and we're working at the Village Gate. I'm doing the Second City show, and we're doing ten show, eight shows a week, uh, six nights a week. Um, and we're working really hard and having a great run, phenomenal run, and getting uh, just get, getting a lot of attention, New York press, etc. And I open the trade paper, and I see um, John Hughes is making the Breakfast Club in Chicago. And uh, blah, 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 you know, lensing has started, you know, for the Breakfast Club and in Chicago. And, and I remember picking up the magazine and just throwing it. And it was in the dressing room backstage at the Village Gate. And um, literally the next morning, I get a call from my agent in Chicago, Harice Davidson. And Harice says, you'll never guess what happened. So what? She said, John Hughes is called. They want you to come and do the Breakfast Club starting tomorrow. I said, what? <laughs> she goes, yeah, a Rick Moranis. Uh, so another actor had the part. Found out it was Rick Moranis. Hold on one second. This might be John Hughes calling. No, it's not. It's my attorney. <laughs> I'll back later. Perfect timing. I told Spielberg. Anyway, um, so uh, long story short, they flew me into Chicago, uh, I, uh, and I worked on the Breakfast Club for the next five, six, seven days, maybe uh, ten days overall, sort of sporadically, and with a bunch of days in between, um, because Rick Moranis had been doing the project, and uh, he and John hadn't seen eye to eye, and he dropped out. Rick did a mutual agreement, and they brought me in. So lo and behold, um, I had my uh, opportunity uh, to do the movie, and I did an audition for it. Wow. Um, which is, you know, in retrospect, kind of amazing, right? Yeah, um, it really is. Yeah. Given all the actors there were and are in Hollywood. You know, I mean, John had the pick of the litter. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Bill Paxton and John Candy and all the people that he hired and worked with after that. So, you know. For me to have done that, and then I did um, Weird Science after that, yeah. I had a small part, and then I did Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and I was totally cut out of that. And um, then John sort of became huge, and you know, was doing the Home Alones and stuff like that. Um, you know, so he he had his own really incredible run in Hollywood, and then sort of I think deserted Hollywood in a way. Yeah. But the thing is, John, is um, talk about a great movie because I guarantee you that somebody is watching that movie every single day. It's just a movie. Any way you look at it, that movie is shown every day. And I mean, just a great concept. You're talking about five kids who get detention. They got to come on a Saturday morning. You got a principal who he's out of touch with today's kids. He doesn't really understand them. And he feels like he has to be that drill sergeant type uh principal and then you got a custodian who could relate to the kids he really understands what it was to be a kid at one time and he doesn't take what uh, the john bender character says to him personally he knows he's just a kid and it was really cool in that way because it just it taught you a lot of life lessons about kids and especially if you're working with kids so i just thought it was just well written from uh start to finish you know, it's funny, you know, you look at the movie and it, it, of course it's like, what, 36 years old, whatever it is now. Um, and then like anything, like, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird or, you know, really cool movies or great movies or well, kind of, it's just the construction of it and the storytelling. And the, the, the one basic thing I think about John overall um, at his best is when he just sort of never condescended to the kids to the audience particularly and the audience being the kids i mean i've said this quite often but i think it's true is that john's movies the adults in a way are kind of like adults in a 
in the Charlie Brown cartoon, like wah wah wah, you know, they're, they're sort of up there, yeah. you know. And and John's, you know, characters and are talking to themselves in their own sort of matrix in their own society. And, you know, to the extent of which you know Matthew Broderick turns out to the audience and delivers basically is talking directly to the audience, etc. You know, he. He was clever and, and wrote really good stuff, but he didn't condescend to his teen audience, which so many movies in Hollywood have done and historically and continue to do. And, you know, when they're written by, uh, you know, people that are not in touch with teens, you can characterize them any way you want, sort of older and out of touch. Um, yeah. You know, like when I was a kid, there, I think the only movie that sort of touched that vein, and it was before my generation, was Rebel Without a Cause. But there were a lot of movies in the late 60s that tried to sort of capture the, the wild, the, the hippie movie, and movie and movement. I mean, there was one called Wild in the Streets, which I think people sort of consider a cult film today. But I remember watching it at the time, you know, and I was 12, 13, 14, like thinking, this movie is just lousy. <laughs> and, the other thing that John brought into movies, technically speaking, because, you know, when, when I saw a movie in the 60s and you saw people dancing, they'd be dancing to music that sounded like rock. It sort of wasn't. So it was like rock-like music or they were trying to make it sound like a popular song, but it really was corny. So that sort of made the movie didn't. But John Hughes brought the soundtrack. So he used, you know, Simple Minds, Wang Chung, etc. All the bands at the time, different songs, and he used them effectively in his movies. And a whole generation of filmmakers have copied that, basically. Right. I mean, you can't you can't solely credit him, credit him with that, but he basically he used it effectively. I mean, so is Scorsese, so is George Lucas, so is Spielberg, etc. But Hughes had his own sort of spin on it, and um, and popularized basically the soundtrack album. Which was huge in the eighties, like you know, oh, yeah. Which, yeah. you know. So Madonna could put a song in a movie, and so on. So, you know, so there was desperately seeking Susan. There were all these different films, where you know the Jonathan Demi and the uh, all all the whole generation of movies in the eighties where soundtracks were uh, as important. And then of course music videos, right? Yeah, that, that accompanied them. So and the, where they'd either use clips from the movie or promo promoted, or the artist would do something totally separate from the film because they're basically giving a finger to the film saying, well, my, my song stands on its own. And they used it in the movie. Like Simple Minds, you know, they had a bit of an attitude about, don't you forget about me, but, which was turned down by Billy Idol, uh, David Bowie and Brian Ferry, right? Yeah, unbelievable. But the thing is too, John, is that for the few scenes you were in that movie, I mean, you gave some powerful, uh, advice especially to the principal um uh, we, we shot a lot more you know yeah i'm sure stuff got edited out of well, but there is a there is a deluxe version out there if you ever want to find it where they have all those scenes yeah and they were on the vhs and john uh, ferreted them away in his place and after he died his camp family gave it to him but m m months after they gave it to them they regretted doing it so they're out there anyway now yeah, that's something I would love to check out because you always wonder. Well, they're like, worth getting. They're out there. Um, uh, I used to have those files, but I mean, frankly, uh, you know, it's best if you get them on your own, but they're out there. I mean, right. it's neat to see because the film, the film, if you understand the genesis of it, which you may not, is like the film was many different permutations before it became you know, by the kids in the library and and uh, the, the teacher and then me interjecting every now and then. And then it was also, they shot a lot of stuff. I mean, it was written differently, then it was carved down and it was shot. And then a lot of stuff was shot extraneously and then it was edited differently. So there were lots of different permutations in the process where it became what it is now. Right. And I think that one person you have to really cement the, uh, give a lot of the glory to is 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 uh, the, the um, editor right dd allen 
who I just yeah. saw a film the other day that she edited. Um, she edited Bonnie and Clyde, uh, but she edited a lot of really great American movies. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, John, uh, The Breakfast Club eventually went to theater, correct? I mean, it was a, it was a theater play as well, right? Didn't it go to theater? You mean played in in uh, with actors in theaters as opposed yeah. to being a movie? Um, it's got a it's got a life in high school productions. I don't think it's ever had a it's never had it's never been mounted on Broadway or anything. It's it's had a table read with um the uh, with uh, Jason Reitman, who uh, whose father was Ivan Reitman, who recently died, um, and who directed uh, Animal House and. Is connected with Bill Murray and all those people, uh, and um, of course Harold Ramis. But Jason was doing a, a, at the at TIFF, the Toronto Film Festival. He did a reading of it. He did a reading here at LACMA, where I think um, Patton Oswalt played the janitor or something. You know, it's become kind of a fun, kitschy thing to do is to take screenplays and read them. Um, and they've uh, em emulated that film in other uh, TV shows. Like I mentioned, uh, I might as well touch on it a little bit now because we're talking about it. They brought you on a TV show called One Tree Hill. It was about uh, kids partnering up and uh, getting to know one another. And you played a character named Carl. And it was almost like a little of a Breakfast Club spoof. Yeah. I mean, uh, talk about that a little bit. Did you enjoy doing that guest spot? Yeah, um, it was, it was, I think, do you have a lot of One Tree Hill fans? <laughs> oh, yeah. You'd be surprised. It's a very popular show. Well, I'm sure it is. I mean, you know, it was cute. It was, um, you know, it was cute. Yeah. The thing about these things is that, you know, um, uh, I wish they'd last a bit longer, but, you know, it was fun. I mean, I did something actually... Um, so another show, like a crime show, NCIS, where they was yeah. a, little bit of, a little bit of an homage to The Breakfast Club. I've done a few of them. Um, I tried to... Uh, I beg your pardon? Yeah, and I just did a movie called The Class with uh, Anthony Michael Hall, which is a basically homage to The Breakfast Club. And what a great career he's had as well. I mean, he really has as an adult actor too. I mean, he's been able to make the transition very good. Well, he had a lot of he had a lot of lean lean years in between, and Michael has been hard at it. I give him a lot of credit. He's a he's um he's a good hearted, strong willed professional. You know, and the the other thing I give him big credit for is a lot of these guys, Michael and Molly and. Maybe Judd. a little less alley, yeah. but well, Judd, I don't know, but a lot of them started young, right? You know, and, and it's, yeah. you know, John Cusack too, oh, I knew when he was a teenager, you know, Rob Lowe, um, despite the fact that he's an LA kid. I mean, these guys, man, um, had a lot of pressure to put on them in the 80s. And um, they, a lot of them started as kid actors. And I get, you know, uh, like I said, when I was in Chicago, I, you know, I ran into a lot of people working at Second City, and there were a lot of movies being made. And I ran into the two Corys, and and those were two train wrecks, right? Yeah, um, and, it was unfortunate. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. So they're not they're not all success stories, and they're kind of and Corey Haim, boy, what a what a what a sweet guy, what a sweet yeah. kid, what a sweet kid, and a really good actor really good actor i just you know i think about him and and you know there are lots of names that you don't know because they never really made it even into the thing because there were just um you know it's cliched but you know showbiz is littered with a lot of people that um broken hearted you know desperate <laughs> individuals that don't make it and what's your feelings john about that like i mean yeah. I could use a guy like Gary Coleman as a great example. He was a very popular child actor on a show called Different Strokes. He was that show. I mean, he was the main kid. And you you read stories how his parents mismanaged his money. They took it from him. He didn't even want to do the show after five seasons. And they kept making him go back. And I, can't, I can't speak specifically to poor Gary Coleman. But 
But what I can say is that I think when things go awry is when the parents aren't happening. Yeah. That's just overall my overall note with it. And even the best times with the, the best of parents, if you have a child who's a teenager that's all of a sudden making a lot of money and is saying, you know, go away, mom and dad, uh, or go away, mom, or you're divorced, or, you know, you know um, parents are having their issues too. So it's not, you, you can't really ascribe blame that easily. No, I was, what I'm saying is I'm not blaming the parents. I'm not that you are, but I mean, it's yeah. situations where you go, you know, you see these, these situations because sometimes, you know, you see parents are living through their children. Um, yeah. The thing about Gary Coleman, I mean, in addition to it, he had sort of a, he was physically, you know, unique and, um, you know, I, I, I knew an actor many years ago who was in Time Bandits, uh, uh, David Rappaport. Um, and he uh, was a little person. He was a, a leader of the band of uh, people, uh, little people in uh, in Time Bandits. I don't know whether you know the movie, the John Cleese, the um, yeah, yeah. Terry Gilliam movie. Anyway, wonderful actor who uh, took his own life, you know, because um, a lot of the... Uh, a lot of actors, you know, personally, you know, have hard times. And then you have people that are, you know, with various disabilities or things like that. Tough, tough world. I guess, like, the main thing I was asking you, though, is it, would you do you think it's a good idea for parents, even though the kids want to do it? But when they're eight or nine years old and they want to get into Hollywood at that young age, do you think parents should wait because of what happens to some of these child stars, some of them don't go on to have great adult careers. And, you know, they're kids and they think this is always going to continue and then it ends. So I don't know, like, if it's necessarily, if there are positives, but there's also negatives to it as well. Well, I mean, I think the, the, the parents that are, that are always most skeptical and have their heads screwed on won't allow their kids to do it, period. Yeah. Or if they do, they let them do it very, very limited or they just say, you know, wait till you're an adult. The ones that let their kids in the door either live near a metropolitan area where they can do it. Although nowadays with videotaped auditions and things, you can you can change the dynamic. But but to be blunt, the the kids that really get into show business have a, it, it it is I would say seventy percent the parents doing. Yeah. So John, let me ask you. I mean, over the years, I mean, you've done so many other things. I mean, you've worked with Tom Hanks, Daryl Hannah. Um, you've also guest starred on some great shows. And I remember Miami Vice, you played that like corrupt uh, public defender. I mean, I, I said to myself, wow, I can never picture him being a bad guy. I mean, did you enjoy doing a lot of those like TV series where you guest starred and stuff or was it more just a job? Well, I remember, I, no, are you kidding me? Everything I do is not a job. Everything yeah. I love to do. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, from my first high school play, you know, like they pay me to do this. No, I, I get ticked off when I work with actors that phone in and are treated like a job. I yeah. love, I love playing bad guys. I love drama. I love doing that stuff because I remember when I was at Second City, I did this scene in the first act of one of the like second or third show I opened where I played a prison inmate, <laughs> and I was like had the cigarettes in my thing and rolled rolled up and. Another uh, cast member, Lance Kinsey, played this real nerd that had to be put in a prison cell with me. And I was, you know, like Jeffrey Dahmer type, scary, really, whatever, just seething with anger. And the audience ate it up. And I remember thinking to myself, going, I can do this stuff for real if I had to, you know, like play real bad guys. Yeah. So the opportunity arose in the movies. Um because I never really got the opportunity to play that sort of guy in a straight play. You know, I never did the John Malkovich roles, you know, like uh, in True West and stuff. And the line of fire, yeah. And, 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 but, but John was working in the theater at the same time, and I was working at Second City. So I was doing the, those guys, you know, Gary Sinise and John Malkovich and Joe Mantegna, they were all doing straight plays other other places. And, you know, Willie Loman and, you know, Death of a Salesman and, you know, Henry the whatever. <laughs> Uh, you know, a, a bomb in Gilead, you know, serious, fun, intense plays, you know, um, mammoth plays, sexual perversity in Chicago, or et cetera. But um, I had fun. 
um, playing these bad guys. And the fact of the matter is, um, you know, um, a lot of actors can't do that. Yeah. They can't do comedy and they can't do drama. And, um, you know, some can, but, you know, uh, I would argue that Robert De Niro does a certain type of comedy, but I don't think he's a funny. And uh, then Robin Williams had a great diversity, but I also think when he did drama, he had a tendency to sort of be a little bit too... Um, Comedic, yeah. Or... He had a way of sort of uh, winking at the audience saying, you know, I, I know that I'm funny or I don't know. There was, I don't know. I don't want to criticize a great actor who did a lot of wonderful work. But, you know, I, I'm, you're competitive with people and, and you look at their, their stuff. I mean, I'm horrible when I watch my own stuff. But I think that what happens is that you uh, you develop, you develop, um, you develop likes for certain things. And I think that, I mean, one thing that my, my agents have told me is that they can, I can do blue collar and white collar. And a lot of actors can't even do that. Yeah. They have to play one sort of class. Although I would never play, you know, anything on Downton Abbey or anything. I don't play anything English. <laughs> All right. So let me ask you, um, you did a show that was pretty popular, uh, forever night. And I mean, you played a tremendous role as a, Detective uh, Shanky. Talk about that uh, show because I mean, that was pretty, uh, you did a lot of good things in that show. And I mean, that's the thing too. You were able to always adapt to different stuff. You could do film, you could do TV. You were able to kind of take any, as long as the writing was good, you made it happen. Well, and thank you for saying that. That's very kind. I think the one thing about doing that show for me was that it did 48 episodes of it. And I also yeah. to write an episode and direct and but is that I got really um, comfortable in front of the camera. Not too comfortable, but comfortable. Um, because you can get too comfortable. And there are certain people I see that get too comfortable in front of the camera that I think that, you know, you got to respect your uh, proscenium and you got to respect the, the camera. But you also got to understand that um, you can't serve it all the time. There's a There's a way of, you know, even the best performers, there's, it's hard to get them to lose the awareness that they're doing something, that there's a, an object there or there's a camera. There's, you know, the directors, I mean, you know, that I really admire ultimately are the ones that can, you know, really make you believe that, you know, this is real. Yeah. Even if it's funny, scary, whatever, you know. Uh, and, and, get that performance, you know? So Forever Night was really cool because I also got to have fun with this guy. And I love playing this, this Chicago sort of uh, aspect on him. We shot it in Toronto and, and a lot of uh, Canadians have sort of this uh, attitude about Americans and particularly people from the Midwest. So I sort of really played it up and got a lot of natural responses from people. But I also wanted him to be a little bit loud, and uh, and I also have to say I was a little bit ballsy with the the powers that be because a lot of the scripts I changed the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I I don't know whether I was entirely loved. Um, at the end of it, I was asked to leave only because they went to the USA Network and they wanted to change the show. I said, okay. I mean, not because they didn't like me, but because uh, basically they wanted to go younger and all this stuff. And if you know the show, they ended up a season, they blew me up in a plane. So they yeah, could, yeah. They couldn't bring me back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know that's TV for you, but. But, 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 you know, I just, I really loved, and I liked working with Garrett, and I, I loved working at that time in Canada. Um, on a personal note, my mother, uh, died a few years after we finished the show and there was a really good time just before she got ill. So there's a lot of good memories for that. And, um, you know, it's a golden time for an actor to work in a series. I haven't had, I mean, I've worked a lot of, you know, I've done uh, 
been a guest on a lot of shows. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so that's you know, it's like it's like spending a day in high school at a lot of different high schools. So, you, know, you get to know everybody, then you got to go. Yeah. Hey, sit over here at the cafeteria at lunch, and then they, and then you got to go. So, John, but, let, me, let me ask you this though. I mean, uh, two shows that you got to get star on, and they were very popular in the 90s was home improvement and of course seinfeld i mean those shows were as tuesday nights it was home improvement thursday nights it was seinfeld they were so the audience loved them i mean how did you enjoy those guest spots because that had to be a lot of fun to be able to work with tim allen and uh guys well, the like home improvement seinfeld. Was, was fun i mean i am um, i i am um, you know i mean when you work on these shows, it's like being driven in a really incredible limousine or being flown in a private jet. If you've ever had the occasion, I've had it once. I mean, it's like, wow. Um, and I can't remember, I mean, the home improvement was, uh, you know, I think the Seinfeld in a lot of ways was more memorable in that um, the part was a lot of fun. And I seemed to get a lot of play People really, really um, yeah. remember the sniffing accountant. But I mean, the home improvement was Tim was great. Um, the kids were, you know, sweet. And uh, Seinfeld, Michael Richards was like one of the hardest working guys I've ever worked with. I mean, the guy's great, funny, funny, funny. Yeah, yeah. And we did this whole sequence where he's sort of checking me out in the bar. I don't know. And he thinks that I'm doing cocaine and he drinks a beer with. Cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> yeah. And um, just great writing. Yeah. Well, Larry Larry David just before the take said to me, John, do not break up. Do not lose, you know, it please don't break. Keep keep your character because we don't know what he's gonna do and we don't know what we're gonna use of what he's gonna do. Yeah. So um if it works, so he was so and he gets hit by the 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 thing at the bar and he gets his head and Michael's just so effing funny and inventive yeah. and just really really crazy sort of energy that's you know the Kramer energy and and like you know I'm right next to it you know I'm like this far away from it right and so what I had to do was the cameras are all out here to my left as I recall and I, I Again, I mean, this is not an original story, but I love saying it. And I had to bite my upstage cheek just to keep from laughing. And if if you watch the, uh, the the Seinfeld, every now and then you can just see my my chin just clench ever so slightly because I'm doing that. And that night when I went home, I looked, went and looked in the mirror, and I basically had taken a chunk out of my cheek, <laughs> trying not to laugh. But I didn't laugh, so. I'm going to go back and watch that because I'm going to look for that. That's nice that you shared that detail because I would have never noticed that. Well, I mean, you know, and uh, I always felt badly for Michael for being vilified for whatever happened at the comedy store and all that stuff, the stupid sort of mishap and story that didn't really, I think, go well for him. But holy moly, working on that show and just watching how he worked. And, and bear in mind, this is from somebody such as myself who's done a lot of comedy. And worked with a lot of great comedy people, and uh, consider myself, you know, somewhat of an aficionado in the field. It's like, wow, this guy's cool. And hitherto, you know, Michael had a, you know, he had a, he had a tough road, right? You know, he did a show called Fridays, which, which was a ABC's knockoff of Saturday Night Live, which was basically lousy. Yeah. And and, um, and a lot of people associated that with that show, particularly performers, didn't get off easy. You know, they. They've had a hard time getting work after that. Um, and he uh, he did a lot of guest spots where he did no comedy before Seinfeld ever came about. I mean, he was on a show saying elsewhere where he basically was like this uh, television reporter who uh, would get on the doctor's nerves and stuff like that. And I mean, so he didn't do a lot of comedy stuff. Nobody knew he could be this funny. So, I mean. It just goes to show that when they give you good writing, it's up to you to execute it, and he did to perfection. Well, it also goes to show that he can act. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I put several other guys, like Hank Azaria, I put in that category. He, he can he can do straight, and then he can do funny. You know, there, there are 
several guys out there that can really, really do both exceedingly well. Um, I think Bill Pullman is one of those guys. Um, you know, I happen to have my favorites. People right. that I think that um, are either underused, underrated, or um, underappreciated. Oh, yeah, they're definitely. That's probably, uh, the, name, I, that's probably the name of a good book. You can put me in the first chapter. <laughs> so let me ask you, John. I mean, you are, in my opinion, anyway, you've done so many things in your career, but you're always going to be associated with the Breakfast Club. That's just my opinion. Number one, are you okay with that? Number two, you have gone, you've shown though that you could spread your wings and do so many other things and i mean a lot of times when you look at a character you can't get past what they were in like it's hard for me to look at henry winkler and not think of the fonz but when i look at you and you're doing another part i don't say that's carl i could look at him and say wow you know this guy played a great part i mean what are you proudest most for your career well the, the cool thing about carl that i liked i mean it you know, um, let's be, to be honest, any, every actor would love to be, you know, known for, i.e. branded for a certain part. The thing about the Fonz, as opposed to, let's say, more more and Mindy, let's compare it with Robin Williams or even uh, Bosom Buddies, Tom Hanks. Yeah. Is, is I worked in advertising and I knew this, remember, remember this well, and if, if I'm known for The Breakfast Club, okay, I have no problem with it. That's fine. I love it. And, and if, you know, people can accept me doing other parts, fine. You know, sometimes it's hard for me to see an actor that I love doing another part. And so, you know, okay, well, that's fine. You know, uh, but, you know, I, as an actor, I can appreciate it. And then, but it's what we used to call in advertising where I got known as perceptual fran franchise. The problem, I think, with Henry Winkler is when you get known for playing a guy that's sort of an, oh, uh, guy and he's not incredibly bright, then you're, the perceptual franchise of Henry Winkler is that those are the types of people he'll play. And the, when you see Bosom Buddies, Tom Hanks, which was a s silly sitcom that he did, but it gave him the wheelhouse because he could do this funny guys and drag and this and that, gave him the wheelhouse to come out and show Hollywood, this guy's diverse. Yeah. Same with Robin Williams. Basically, Mork and Mindy was a showcase for Robin Williams' craziness. And that allowed him to come in with his carte blanche into Hollywood. So the perceptual franchise you come out of, you know. So what I usually get thrown at me is guys that are smart, uh, underachievers, Carl the janitor types, you know, wise, kind of sneaky, a little bit, uh, you know. You know, uh, so I'll get variations on a theme in that way, you know, good, bad, indifferent, you know. I did a movie called Deep End of the Ocean where I played a, a yeah. father whose wife had stolen a child and I didn't know it and she died and now I'm raising the son like he's my own and I discover that it's not mine anymore. So I'm a victim. But a smart guy who's sensitive who loses a child, that's a part that is within my emotional and my perceptual franchise wheelhouse. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Those are things that, you know, what I don't get is I, I'm not going to get um, the Clint Eastwood cowboy guy. That's not me. It's not even a difference of a leading man type. It's a question of what's your perceptual franchise. I mean, Bill Murray gets occasionally leading guy types, but, you know, is he a character actor leading man? I don't think so. It's, it's his perceptual franchise of what he can pull in. I know that's kind of a advertising term, but I think it's kind of important because basically you look at, you, when you commodify actors, which you do, you well, what are they known for? And that's the same thing as your, you know. Yeah. So he's done of, she's done a lot of horror. He's done a lot of B movies. Oh, he's done a lot of, uh, you know, nude. He's he's done porn or soft porn. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Everybody's yeah. got a a wheelhouse. Right. So <laughs> let me so let me ask you, John, um, before we go. What number one? What oh, we have to go now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, I could keep talking, but um, what do you have upcoming? And number two, um, what would you say was probably your most rewarding part of being in Hollywood? Well, you know, I'm I'm never one to entirely like look back and think, well, because when 
it's almost like an obituary where you go, well, you know, okay. I mean, my, my pat answer, what's my most exciting part? It's like the next one. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's kind of the, uh, my optimistic actor's response. But I really love doing um, internal affairs with yeah. uh, Richard Gere. Richard Gere, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, with Mike Figgis. I thought that was phenomenal. That was a really, really intense experience. I loved doing Roxanne. Oh, yeah. Great um, movie. Yeah. I, I really had fun. A lot of people from that, and uh, Fred Skepsi, the director. I loved doing a Guillermo del Toro's Shape of Water, small part that I had. It was just phenomenal to be around him, and and we shot stuff, and I, I got to play uh, this really character Armenian Greek guy, which was fun to lose myself. I kind of like not being me. Um, right. I like taking vacations from me. Um, I'm serious. I mean, that was fun to do. And uh, sort of be one of my uncles in a different time. And, you know, um, it's fun to work with really great directors who are confident. Um, I loved working on Legally Blonde uh, with Jennifer Coolidge and, yeah. and Reese Witherspoon. Um, Robert Luketic, who's gone on to do some, you know, it was a tough fil film for him to do. He was a first time Hollywood director. And, um, but, you know, the, I can really count the number of like, and I'm not going to tell you them, but the, the sort of the films that, you know, sometimes you think you're, you're going to do an amazing movie and you go out and you shoot it and it's, an okay experience and then you see the movie and it's not very good right and sometimes you go okay well you read a script and it's a it's it's a good script could be made well and then you go out and you have a maybe a really great time shooting it and then afterwards you go oh this movie can't be any good and it comes out and it's really good and you go yeah. well that, there are all these different sort of factors sometimes I had a great time shooting Roxanne. It was a great movie that came out. I had a great time movie doing this movie called, called Not That Funny, um, which is out there, which didn't do that well. But I did Everybody Wants to Be Italian is a fun little movie I did with, uh, you know, I've done a lot of movies that haven't done well, but they're, they're, they're still fun to watch. And um, uh, my my wife and I, Heidi and I, were looking for the movie. Uh, I wanted to show a movie the, the other day called "We're Talking Serious Money," that I did with Fran Drescher and and Dennis Farina, and it's yeah. on YouTube. And it's really not a great aspect ratio. Yeah. You know, phone up the producers and say, "Why isn't it out there?" But it's a funny movie. But you know, Get Shorty that that movie everybody watches, right? Oh yeah, and you know, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to get your feelings on this as well. What do you think about critics? Because a lot of times I'll watch movies and I'll be like, wow, this is a great movie. And they'll give it maybe one star. And then sometimes I'll watch a movie that I'm like, oh, you know, I don't see what the fuss was about. And it'll get four stars. So let me, do you think sometimes critics in Hollywood have agendas the way they rate movies? Because, I mean, there's been a lot of great movies over the years and they have kind of never given them the recognition they deserve. Yeah. You know, I'm not really going to be a good person you want to ask about critics because I, I think that they serve a useful purpose the way, you know, certain dispensers in a restroom might serve a purpose. Um, I really have a low opinion of them for the most part. Right. I, I think, um, you know, I think that, you know, they're all different types of critics. And... Um, I learned very early on, if you're going to believe the good, you have to believe the bad. And having been served out several really horrible reviews when I first started at Second City, I, I quickly learned not to believe any of it. And recently I got a phenomenal review in this film, The Class, which is beautiful. And I distributed it and people were slathering me with praise. But I can't really believe that. Because um, when if I've if, if you ever I've been in a position where I've hired a publicist, and then they start writing stuff that you ask them to send out, and then you see it come back, 
uh, in the newspaper and you realize it's basically my information loop. And if, if I start believing the stuff that comes out of my mouth, like that way, like all that stuff is crazy making. Yeah. So, I mean, the people that I've known career-wise, the John Belushi's of the world that thought that they were the person up on the screen and started believing their own PR, Chris Farley's, they die because they end up doing, consuming all this stuff and stop learning their craft and become addicts and die. And even people that aren't physically addicted to drugs, you can't dwell in the world of fame so long without it chewing you up in certain ways. So critics overall serve a function. Um, you know, <laughs> I took a year of journalism in school and I wrote, started writing a lot of criticism. And I wrote this scathing review in my first year college newspaper about the Rolling Stones, you know, calling them washed up and everything. This was 1973. Right. <laughs> and, right. And I'm, and I'm calling them washed up. People came at me with knives. And also it was, I read this review. I found it the other day somewhere in my archives. It is the most arrogant thing. But I was pierced with power when I wrote that thing. I remember going, whoa, I'm going to say what I think about the Rolling Stones and Keith and Mick, look out. And I can't help but think that there was a bit of, you know, that in critics, even some of the best. And like, you know, I read Pauline Kael and, um, you know, I'm a much different generation than you, but I, you know, I loved reading Kenneth Tynan, a great British um, film critic, and Andre Bazin, these guys that wrote the Cahiers de Cinema, which shaped the new wave cinema. You know, I studied film and I, you know, I know that stuff. Um, and I think critics serve a very dear, important, but, you know, the ones that, um, that dwell too close to the, uh, you know, the, the, the free bar at the screenings and, and are sycophants, that's a different story. Right. How's that for a two minute answer? <laughs> well, I wouldn't have it any other way. Well, John, I want to thank you for giving me the time. You gave oh, God, me I must have bored the hell out of you. No, not at all. I, I knew this would be great, and you made it great. And um, I really do applaud your career. And like I said, I mean, I am a big Breakfast Club fan, but just watching your other work as well. And I mean, the, the oh, way that, like, you know, I really do appreciate uh, you as an actor, but also as a person. And I mean, one thing that I learned today about you is, you know, you do not believe in your own press or take yourself too seriously because you showed that you're an even better person than actor. And I really do applaud you on a great yeah. career. And thank yeah. you for coming on today. So before at least, did you see the Umbrella Academy? Not yet, no. Well, you gotta, that's something new that I've done that I did the last yeah. few years. And um, I have this movie called Love Shot that's out there that people should see that's, that's available to be streamed. A lot of a lot of things, and I have a move. Uh, I have an album, Too Hip for the Room, where I cover "Don't You Forget About Me." So I'm going to plug that's my stuff. Oh, so okay. Well, you know what? I'm going to watch that stuff, and then let's have you back on again, and we'll talk. And I'm about on cameo. All I'm on cameo, so people can get like personal messages from me for like twelve cents. It's amazing. <laughs> well, I really do appreciate this. Uh, it was a real for honor sure. for me. And thank you again for coming on. I really do appreciate it. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. Thank I you, John. It. And folks, of course, that's the one and only. He needs no introduction, but we are going to give him one because he is so deserving of it. <laughs> the one and only John Kapalos for In the Spotlight. I'm Mike Kenichi saying good night, everyone. All right. Perfect.